I've been a horror fan all my life, and if there's one decade that I would single out as the best decade for horror, it's not the 1980s, which is the answer that a lot of people give. It's actually the 1930s. The 1930s were a time of extreme growth in the motion picture business, as well as a lot of turmoil about what should be allowed in films and not allowed. It's difficult today, where we face very little in the form of censorship, to imagine what these filmmakers went through during this period in the genre to make the great entertainment they made. Most film historians separate the 30s into two distinct groups, pre-code Hollywood and post-code Hollywood. That's not exactly an accurate depiction, however, because the code was actually passed in 1929 before the 30s even began. There was no real enforcement until 1934, and even then, the rules were kind of wonky for another few years. Horror movies weren't the main reason for the code, after all. It was more the gangster films, which were extraordinarily popular, but were also seen as glamorizing violence and the gangster lifestyle, which was very much an issue at this time. But horror films ended up taking the biggest brunt of the backlash against violent cinema, just as it would again in the 1980s under Jack Valenti's MPAA. But in the 1930s, there was additional challenges as the entire world of film was so uncharted. People didn't know when they walked into a movie theater what they should expect at all. And it was not a no-risk game for the studios either. This was a nascent business finding its footing. Exhibitors were popping up wildly across the country because it was a very popular form, but it was also a form that was extremely, extremely vulnerable in a lot of counties to the local obscenity laws. 1932's Murders in the Rue Morgue is a universal production that starred Bela Lugosi. The entire production happened as a result of Lugosi not getting the lead in Frankenstein. As it turns out, we ended up winning twofold, because while Frankenstein is the better known film, and it certainly jump-started Karloff's career, Murders in the Room Morgue is actually just as good of a film in many, many ways. It doesn't compare with Bride of Frankenstein, but I would put it on level or even slightly better than the original James Whale Frankenstein. Murders in the Room Morgue is based ostensibly on Edgar Allan Poe's story of the same name. It's not exactly an accurate adaptation of the story, but it covers the basic groundwork. Important here is that Lugosi gets to play a villainous role that is truly insane, not one that is supernatural, but one that is extremely misguided. The 1930s were a time when Darwin's theories were coming to public awareness in a way that was directly confronting the established order, specifically the orthodoxy of religion. It was scary for a lot of people. And a lot of the horror films at this time misrepresented evolution by means of natural selection to very animated means. This film does exactly that. And while its use of Darwin's theories is not as egregious as, say, Captive Wild Woman a decade later, it is still an extreme misrepresentation that preyed on the public's fear. We talk a lot about how horror films are always based their supernatural or extended fears on real-life terrors, and here was a perfect example. The general public's misunderstanding of the emerging science was a perfect ground, incredibly fertile, for the horror genre. Modern audiences may find themselves oddly sympathetic to Lugosi's villain for a very specific reason. He's not wrong. The application is incredibly misguided, and the science is presented absolutely wrong, but his general philosophy and the objections against it favor him. Murders in the Rue Morgue is probably the best looking of all the universal films of its time. It leans heavier on the German Expressionist movements than even Frankenstein or Dracula. It has a real urban sensibility as well, which is different than all the other canon of the time. And it does one thing that I think is easy to miss, but should not be overlooked. It presents a human story at its center. In a story like Dracula, the domestic story of Jonathan Harker and his would-be bride is sort of lost in the equation. Same thing with Frankenstein and his fiance. But here, the love story is allowed to feel absolutely real for its time period. And it's the crux of the drama that unfolds. The horror comes from outside to affect this relationship. And that's important because rather than going to look for trouble, trouble finds them. It's a very, very smart way to get the audience to identify correctly with the plight of the protagonists.
I don't often talk about actors during my reviews or autopsies of films, and that is the reason for this. I am not an actor. I know what I like to see in actors, but I don't understand the craft of acting any more than I understand building a skyscraper. So I'm not going to pretend. If acting is bad and it takes me out of a film, then I will have something to say about it. Good acting I don't normally point out because I expect it. I expect that the stories will be told by gifted storytellers, and every actor is a storyteller. But I do want, in this case, to point out Sidney Fox, an absolutely captivating performance from a young actress who needs to shoulder long segments of this film. Her performance is perfect for the time period, and while it has all the conventions of 1930s acting, she is immediately likable. In fact, in many ways, she almost steals the film from Lugosi, which is unthinkable. But here, watching her, you actually want her to survive this ordeal. And because it's a pre-code film, again, the code existed, it just wasn't being enforced, you don't really trust that a happy ending is guaranteed. It's the rare film that does feel dangerous 90 years after its release. Now you may wonder why we don't talk about this film in the canon of classic Universal Monsters. Well, for one, there's not a monster per se in the film. There's a mad doctor and there is an ape. There is a diabolical plot and it's based on Poe. It all seems to work perfectly towards inclusion in the classic monster cycle. But the classic monster cycle from Universal is usually thought of very specifically as being tragic monster stories. This is not that. And while I think that's short-sighted and I'd like to see this included in the classic Universal canon, I also understand why it is outside of it as well. But don't ignore it simply because it's outside of the existing titles that you think of immediately. Dracula, Frankenstein, The Wolfman, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Because this is an important groundbreaking film that laid a lot of the foundations of modern horror. Another thing I often do not discuss is the home video releases of these titles, and that's probably because I don't really care how you find these films as long as you find them. But in this case, a special note should be given. Shout Factory's imprint, Scream Factory, which releases their genre films, has released a great remaster of this film onto Blu-ray. My first encounter with the film was extremely grainy, splicey, and faded. To see it in this new, reconstituted version is a revelation and hopefully it'll help bring even more people to this film. So while I don't normally recommend any specific format for your viewing of these films, in this case Murders in the Rue Morgue deserves to be seen in its best possible way and the Scream Factory disc is exactly that.